This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. Given that tomorrow is Halloween, I thought I'd do something a little lighter. And now I'm not going to wade into the Halloween, good or bad stuff. Go to Mass, please, and I observe all the, all the saints-related things. Have a, If you find yourself being gone after by a Protestant who is celebrating their schism, make sure to, you know, act in charity, but also defend the faith. That ain't been all been said. Halloween has always struck me as an absurd thing. There's an absurdity to Halloween. And it's... <laughs> I thought I'd go to one of my favorite Catholic writers, someone who deeply influences the work I do every day, and that's Hilaire Belloc. You know this picture of the guy with shades I talk behind sometimes lately, only on the weekends, really? Well, that's just a stylized picture of Hilaire Belloc, as you can see right there. <laughs> he was a, a writer of some repute back in, uh, you know, the early 20th century, known for, um, on the one side, one of the most absurd books written as in the style of a children's story, but aimed at adults ever written, um, as well as uh, talking about history and economics and politics and all sorts of other things from a Catholic perspective. And this is his essay on called On Fame. And he goes over, you know, how to become famous, basically, and how everybody wants to become famous. It's only the most holiest of men who have mostly gotten rid of that desire for fame and fortune. And he tells you at the end how to become famous, and it's absurd, but he's not wrong. <laughs> so with that having been said, Hilaire Belloc, on fame. There is nothing in the high comedy of the world so admirably comic as the special department called fame. I don't mean comic in the sense that it makes you roar with laughter. I mean comic in the sense that it illustrates the nature of man. All men desire fame. I have never known a single exception to that rule, and I doubt if anyone else has, though I have known a few very holy men who have very nearly got rid of the love of fame. There was left in them no more than a trace of it. I say that in a very few holy men I have in the course of my life met, those who had left in them only a trace of this love of fame. A very much larger number of exceedingly unholy men have I met who had largely lost the love of fame because they were tired out. They had suffered or enjoyed so much emotions. They had seen so many men rise to prominence, often suddenly and, as a rule, without any good reason for their elevation. They had felt so many disappointments, rushing after pleasure and nearly always missing it. They had reached such a contempt for their fellow beings, the mob who are the makers of fame, that they had become in some large measure indifferent. But not altogether. I have never yet knew a man so blasé that his face did not change when he heard that some action or creation of his part had been praised. Yes, even when that praise came from men most insignificant. There is, I believe, but one exception to this, and that is the tedium of repeated praise, and especially of praise repeated for the wrong reasons. I knew a man once who was a poet of the third or fourth class, being also wealthy. Now this man, like many other wealthy men, indulged as a pastime in the hatred of his own country, which country, I may tell you, was one of the citizens of which are given to the most extravagant complacency and self-praise. This man, while he was still quite young, had written one line, only one, in which he expressed strong emotion on seeing once more the shores of his country after long absence overseas. The line was commonplace, vulgar and silly, also alliterative. It therefore had great vogue. It appeared in many anthologies. It was the only thing on which he received a fan mail, and young girls used to drive him mad by pestering him to write it down in their autograph books. At last, my poet simply could not bear his fame in, his, in this one particular and came near to changing his name and flying to the Antipodes. But for the most part, men are especially pleased with praise of their verse, and that is as it should be. For in the first place, if verse were not praised, it would soon dry up. It has already nearly dried up as it is, and it would be a great pity for verse to dry up considering the pleasure it gives to the young. Certainly, verse would not carry on long for the sake of any profit made out of it, 
For though occasionally a man does make profit by selling his verse, the excellence of the verse has no more to do with the money value of it than the beauty or majesty of a landscape has to do with the money value of the soil. I suppose the desert landscape, seen from the escarpment of the Middle Atlas, covers an area much like that of Greater London, yet there is no comparison in the rateable values of the two. The French Sahara is emphatically what the late Lord Salisbury well called it, light soil. But the value of the build-up area between Ealing and the Isle of Dogs, Sydenham, and Highgate is considerable, nay, larger. Also, I did hear one man say that he thought it beautiful. I don't. Fame coming by way of verse is the favorite example, I suppose, because it is the most enduring. Most pieces of great verse have their authorship securely tied on them, and even the poor mutts who think that the Odyssey was written by a committee of dons have not much longer to live. Well, to have written a great piece of verse is certainly to have acquired an enduring form of fame. The poet usually gets it after he is dead, and it is a wise man who, when he had been asked whether he expected fame for his metrical compositions, replied, I shall have all the fame a dead man wants. Of the other forms of fame, a long way after literary fame, the greatest is military fame. But I have always thought that the pleasure here was a little mixed by the certain knowledge of any good soldier that he has the thing was not done by his hand alone. There is the quality of the troops, there is their handling of their weapons, there is the aid given by subordinates, and there is the inner knowledge of luck, and sometimes of complete irresponsibility. Many a battle has been won by a disgusting fluke. Then there is this drawback also about military fame that many a man must know he has deserved, yet not attained it. And there is this further drawback about military fame, even more than fame for verse. It catches on to incongruous, unworthy occasions of and men. A first victory after many defeats or doldrums is always the most violently acclaimed. Blenheim was far more extolled than Ramillies, yet Ramillies was the greater feat of arms by far. And as for Fabius Concutator, I certainly can't remember what his last decisive battle was, if any, and I very much doubt if you can. Yet according to all accounts, he did the trick. Time was when men could acquire fame by holiness, and it still is so, I am told, in North Africa and the East. Men always acquire fame rapidly by getting hold of a large sum of money, no matter how. Fame is even to be got by a marriage. Fame can be acquired by anybody who does not distinguish between fame and notoriety. But then this kind of fame is not really fame at all. Fame can be got by mere purchase, which is a different thing from the fame of sudden fortune. Fame can be got by inheritance, by mistake, and even on very rare occasions, by courage. But there is one quite certain way of acquiring such measure of fame as is suitable to your condition in life whether as politician or a pork butcher, and it only requires one advantage, longevity. This method, which I heartily recommend to everybody with the prospect of a few years of life, is flattery of the young. Be good to the young, but that is not enough. Flatter them. You will soon die, but the young, like our evil deeds, live after us, and in the middle age they invariably revere those who praise them in youth. Thus they create a legend. I have never known it to fail. And there you have it. Belloc was a good friend of Chesterton and of a priest, a Dominican priest named Father Vincent McNabb, and they were advocates for all sorts of things, including localism, making, you know, making sure that private property was owned by as many individuals and families as possible instead of the state <laughs> or gigantic corporations. They were advocates for truly Catholic understanding of the problems the world is facing to the point where they said things that I can't repeat here because we kept me in a lot of trouble. He's one of my, he is one of my sort of intellectual heroes. I don't have to agree with everything he said to find the man absolutely brilliant. Curious what you thought of this essay on fame by Hilaire Belloc. If you want to find it, you'll need to, my copy comes from a very, very old book, probably from a, an original edition of it called the book that I had this from is called the silence of the sea. And it's a library rescue. The thing is um, an antique. <laughs> but if you can find a copy of it, get a copy. It's a, it's a collection of short essays. So anyway, let me know what you thought of this in the comments, please. Like and subscribe if you haven't. It really does help. As is sharing this on social media, that helps a lot as well. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.